Today's video, we look at a group of unsolved murders that took place in Jefferson Davis, Louisiana. This case has become known as the Jeff Davis Eight. In May of 2005, the badly decomposing body of a 28-year-old named Loretta Lewis would be pulled out of a canal in Jefferson Davis, which is located in southwest Louisiana. Loretta's death was first seen as a bad drug deal, as she was a well-known fighter of addiction that would engage in trading herself to satisfy said addiction. And sadly, because of this, her case would not be taken seriously. Her case would slowly fall into the background until June 18th, when another body would show up. That belonging to 30-year-old Ernestine Patterson, who was found in a canal not too far away from Lynn. Investigators would end up taking two men into custody, but charges would be dropped, however, because there was not enough evidence linking them to the killings. Now, moving forward about two years, we would get to the third victim, this time 21-year-old Christine Lopez, who was found in yet another canal in Jefferson Davis. And like before, there would be arrests, where the charges dropped. This would start a cycle of killing and body dumping in those canals. And a year and a half would pass, with police finding four more bodies. They were 26-year-old Whitney DeVos, 23-year-old Lacania Brown, 24-year-old Crystal Xenon, and 17-year-old Brittany Gray. And later in August of 2009, the last body would be found, that belonging to 26-year-old Nicole Guillory. All the victims did the same kind of work, and all the victims had no sign of trauma, though the autopsies would point to asphyxia as the most likely way these women died. Between all the similarities of each victim, the police had no choice to finally accept the fact that all these cases were linked. They would even suggest that it may be a serial killer. Though with that suggestion and accepting the fact that all these cases were linked, police still couldn't make any headway on the case. This brings us to what could be the most disturbing part of this case. After some digging from journalists, they would conclude that it was more likely that a person part of law enforcement was behind this. This is because there was just way too many countless missteps in the investigation. One example being the purchase of a truck by Chief Investigator Warren Gray. This truck had belonged to an inmate who was friends with the victim. This paired with a witness reporting that Lopez was in that very same truck the day that she went missing. By the time police would even consider looking at the truck, it had already been resold and thoroughly cleaned. But instead of thoroughly investigating Gray, police chose to find him, and most surprisingly put him in charge of evidence of the Paris Sheriff's Office. It would be this that would catch the eye of journalist Ethan Brown, who would end up doing his own digging on these cases. What he found would also suggest that it was not a serial killer, but a massive cover-up by the Paris Sheriff's Office. First, he would find out that all the victims knew one another, that all struggled with drug addiction, and were all trading themselves for said addiction. All apparently showed signs of being anxious before going missing. Second, there would be a sergeant at the time, Jesse Ewing, that would speak with and tape the two inmates about the truck incident. After the talks with the inmates, he would grow increasingly suspicious of his co-workers. He would send the interview that he did with the inmates to the FBI, and for some reason, they would send it to the head of the task force to which he worked for. Not long after this, he would be let go and no reason given. The journalist Brown would hear through multiple sources that apparently there were witnesses pointing to a singular person. This was Officer David Berry, who witnesses say he and his wife would regularly drive down the roads of the canals looking for women who were trading themselves. At that point, they would pick them up, drug them, and take them home. After all these allegations, for some reason, police did not see him as a suspect. He was brought in for one interview and was completely dismissed as a suspect, but there was never a reason given as to why. Thirdly, we now move on to the person known as Richard, a pimp who was allegedly a police informant at the time. He also had witnesses place him around the scene of the murders and also had a well-known working relationship with the victims. He too would only be briefly questioned and then completely dismissed and ruled out as a suspect. Lastly, Brown would point to a person that owned a hotel that was fairly close to the canals, who allegedly had a relationship with three of the victims. 
This person would end up being shockingly Charles Bustani, who is currently running for a seat on the Senate. And like the suspects before him, he would be quickly interviewed, quickly dismissed, and nothing would ever come of it. Back in 2009, the sheriff would order everyone who was involved in the case to do a DNA test. But as of today, they continuously refuse to allow anyone to see the results of these DNA tests. And after all this, after all the death, after everything that Brown found, the victim's family still have no answers. And unfortunately, these cases still remain unsolved. If you enjoyed this video, please consider liking and subscribing.